and it offended Don Henley, which really doesn't make a difference. You should blame Black Flag. Hey, this is Party Like a Rockstar podcast, and I'm your host, Joel. Today's episode is brought to you by Misha's Kind Foods. They're an LA-based small business making the world's finest non-dairy cheese on the market today. They're lactose-free, paleo, keto, kosher, perev, and 100% vegan. If you like what you see, check out the next video. If you like this video, please subscribe and like by clicking the little round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or our other guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle is Joel Rody. If you haven't already read my book, Memoir of a Roadie, it's now available through Amazon and paperback Kindle or as an audiobook. I hope you enjoy the show. What's up, Mike? What's up, Joel? I was just skimming, I was just skimming your book, man. I love it. That's, That's funny. Uh, I like your hair back, John. Yeah, I, was, I wanted to look smart tonight. Where is that mane at? He's got a mane. Man. That's back here. Oh, oh yeah. Man. Yeah, your rock star hair still. He's yeah, got he's got hair, so <laughs> good. Yeah, a couple of guys almost. Uh, you all, you're in your fifties, and I'm almost in my fifties, so we still yeah. got it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, let me introduce you guys, and we'll get going on music stuff. Yeah, yeah. Mike Davenport is a founding member of the Ataris. He joined the band playing bass in 1997 left in 2005, but came back in 2014 and stayed through 2016. He's also in the band Versus the World. John Kalura joined the Ataris as their lead guitar player, piano player, and backing vocalist in 2001. He played with them through 2008 and also came back in 2013 through 2014. So how do you guys know each other? I meant yeah, Mike. I don't know. That was, you know, that was, that was like the worst. Well, that was funny, though. I was trying to think, how can I come off on a really bad Well, night? it's funny because I met Mike in August of 1999 in Atlanta, Georgia. It was the first day of a tour that my old band was called Beefcake on Fearless Records. Uh, we, had a, we had this kid that was a booking agent in the South Bay. He had another band called the Ataris that I never heard of. And put us on tour together. And we met that day and did almost three months together. Yeah, of tour. I always say that uh, back those, uh, those, those tours were Royal Flush was the name of the company. that. That's right. And uh, I always say that that was uh, the Backyard Basements and Elks Lodge tours. But uh, those were cool, man. And uh, John and I hit it off right off the bat. Uh, we, we got along really well. Our bands couldn't have been any more different. Um, but for some reason it worked, we loved each other. And that's almost as important as you know, um, going on tour is that you get along with the other bands as uh, whether they're compatible with you, with your fans. Our fans- well, You don't were, get along with them, you just try to out-asshole them and can it, make it fun. Yeah. You, couldn't well, you, out, you couldn't out-asshole Beefcake. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the thing is, Joel, you know how every, like in most bands, band members have roles within the band besides their instruments. And Mike and I shared the same role. We were the guys that were trying to, yeah, you know, we were the businessmen of the band, we were, trying yeah, to get yeah. the band. We were the networkers. We were, I think in the, the real money. world, they call it the responsible people. In yeah. Yeah. That's it. yeah. We were. And that's probably why we, we hit it off quicker. That's true. So, so you're in Beefcake, you're in the Ataris. And you, so Beefcake was playing with the Ataris and then you joined the band at some point. Yeah, that's a great story, actually, um, because uh, uh, we had a guitar player, Marco Pena, that was on and off with us uh, for a few years. Um, you know, Pat Riley. We talked about that before. But Marco started with us. Then Marco left for a while. Pat came in and then Pat left and Marco came back. And so we were on the warp tour. We were just starting to get really big. I think, I think uh, we were starting to get all that uh, wine and dine by the major labels and all that stuff. And we, uh, I knew that Marco uh, and Chris's relationship, Chris Rowe, our singer was breaking down um, and it wouldn't be too long for this world because it had already broken down once before. Yeah. So I actually called John and asked John, hey, John, do you want to come and be guitar tech on, we were at warp tour 2001, right? 
Is yep. that, is that what it was? Oh, okay, so that's where is that where you? Because I heard in the other interview you were you were basically you were stoked that you were doing shows with STP and you were mentioning these other bands. Is that two thousand one? Yeah, two thousand and one. So two thousand one. Well, I did, did shows with you guys because I was working for STP and yeah, that time. we did. We did. When did we do uh, Pukul Pop with STP? Remember that? In uh, that yeah, it was uh, that same year. That, that same year. In, uh, yeah, in the late summer. Yeah, two thousand August. Huh. And, and we did it which 2003. Show? We did it both 2001 and 2003. 2003, yeah. I wasn't with them, but uh, yeah. what was the show in 2001 that you guys were on? Uh, Hukul Pop. It's one of the biggest festivals in Belgium. It's awesome. Really oh, awesome. Oh, so yeah, not me. I didn't do Europe with them. Oh, oh well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I reminisce, but there's no reminiscing. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds fucking cool, though. <laughs> yeah, I think we did like Reading and Leeds and, yep. and all those with, with Lowlands. Uh, yeah. yeah. STP was on all those. So. Neat. But yeah, I, I, I remember uh, uh, Wyland. I, I always back then I wanted pictures with everybody uh, so that I could later when I wasn't uh, popular anymore, like now I could uh, go up to people and say, oh, look at this picture of me and Scott Wyland. And so I asked Wyland for a picture. and We were both pretty inebriated. And so somebody got up there with the camera, getting ready to take it. And Wyland grabbed me and stuck his tongue down my throat. And he, we took the picture. It was one of the greatest pictures ever uh, that I was, it, it looked like pretty intense. <laughs> uh, I, I love that picture of me and Wyland. He was, he was a cool guy. So, uh, but, so I go on this tour in 2001 with them. First day I was, I'm not a guitar tech. I, I barely can play the guitar. So I go, to, I'm like, sure, why not? Because the Ataris were always a circus. So we, I go out there. Um, the first day is Phoenix. It's like 110 degrees. They wouldn't allow us to put the gear on the trucks at that time. We had to wait a day or two. It was miserable, long day. I hated it, but I stuck it out. And uh, it was literally about six shows later, we were in San Francisco. And you know how Warp Tour works. You never know when you're going to play until about 10 in the morning. They just do a draw of who's going when. And, and the Ataris were on early, maybe 1230, maybe one o'clock in, in the afternoon. And uh, when we woke up that morning, we were in Ventura the night before. I just go to work. I would start taking the gear out and doing stuff. And I noticed Marco wasn't on the bus because he, the guys were from Santa Barbara. He was partying that night and never, never made it on the bus. And you know how cell phone, and not everybody had a cell phone, but the story was, of course, Mike was up and, and he knew that this was, might be an issue. So I was like, listen, I never played these songs, but I see you guys every day. Let's just practice some songs. He'll show up by the second song. It'll be funny. And, and he'll, you know, I'll give him the guitar and that's it. Well, of course, now it's, it, it, it's like 1030, almost 11. And he, and he's Marco's on the, got him on the phone. Right. And you could tell he's not going to show up for hours. So uh, at that time, Kevin Lyman was the band's manager. It just was embarrassing if they were going to have to ask them to play later. You didn't want to do that. So I just said, screw it, man. Let's Chris. Then, of course, Chris Rowe finds out. And he was <laughs> we just sat in the bus. I learned the songs as quickly as I could. Yeah. Comb my hair. Put, <laughs> put on maybe a, a better T-shirt than I owned. And I went up there and we did it. Right. And it was OK. No one knew the difference. Right. But afterwards, I knew uh, that that was when shit was going to go down. And I kind of stayed away. And, you know, Warped Tour is like high school. So you hear the rumors like, dude, I hear some shit's going down today. And I'm like, I don't want to. No, Marco is my friend. Like, yeah. uh, I, I knew the situation. But, you know, anyway, and then it was like uh, hours later, I had saw Marco who showed up. I stayed away. And then I got the call like it was the mafia from Mike to come in to the bus. It was like dim lit bus. And there's Mike at the table. And then he's, he's like giving me the offer. I can't refuse. Yeah. And he's like, hey, Marco's gone. He, we, we sent him home. Do you want to finish the rest of the tour? And then we got to go to Europe. And, you know, it's one of those things where I literally was like, of course, you know, but I was scared shitless because I had this feel. I never, I never flew to Europe before. You know, I, this was, these guys were my friends and they were big, they were getting big. I was playing on board tour and there was thousands of people. So sure. uh, I was definitely 
shit in my pants. But of course, the only real question I, if Mike, you remember the only, that's really probably question, why they let you in the band. He's like, he's yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I asked him two questions. And the first one was, do I have to carry your shit anymore? <laughs> Cause I didn't want to, <laughs> right. He said, no. And then I was like, you, you know, you think you bump up the pay a little bit, you know, but, and he did. So, and that was it, you know, the nice side of my and, and money. Of me. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, I I foresaw that. I I brought John on not because I wanted John to be my guitar tech, because I knew that that we're going to need a replacement, and I was real good at that. Um, you know, of going, okay, we I, we can't be in a position where we just grab anybody. I'd rather have this guy that I love and that I've already toured around with for months at a time in the hairiest yeah. of situations. And so it worked out good. And then, you know, by the, we, we signed to the majors, we made John a full member. And, uh, and you know, and to, to this day, we're still the best of friends. What, what, one of my favorite people in the whole world. And I love Marco too. Marco and I are great friends. And we actually did a little side project with, uh, with the guy, Chris Flippin from Lagwagon um, uh, called Cave Mummy, even years later. And so, and Marco was part of the beginning of Versus the World too. We were called Pen Cap Chew. So, Okay, I so versus the world Marco. is the dudes at the record store. Well, it, it's it's Donald Spence. Don, Donald it was this kid who uh, was a huge Atari's fan. We met him in in Texas when he was like fifteen, and he's that kid that said, "Oh, uh, we told him if you're ever in Santa Barbara, look us up." And one day we're at the record store, and he's like, "I'm here," and he ran away from home at like 16 and my drummer from the Atari's Chris Knapp put him on his couch and he lived there in Santa Barbara. So we put him to work at the record store. And then as we were making a story, John will, will tell you about this too. Chris would be going, Chris Rowe, our singer would leave for a long, long periods of time and we want to rehearse the songs. So we started rehearsing the songs with Donald. Donald, we realized this kid can play and sing. So we started rehearsing the songs and did a little side project and, and um, and then that's when I realized, oh man, this guy, this guy's he 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 to me, you know, that's one thing is I really uh, felt lucky to to find Chris because I had sang and played bass in bands for years, and I realized that there's a much next level past me. And mm -hmm. Chris Chris Rowe was the first one I, I found that, and then I saw Donald, and Donald was the next one. Donald was like, oh, so yeah, we we started the band out of the record store, me and Donald. Um, the record store was called Atari's? Down on Haley. Down, Down on Haley is the name of the record store. Yeah, it was named after the Nerf Herder song. There's a Nerf Herder song. As you know, you lived in Santa Barbara. Haley, right. Haley was the one scuzzy street in Santa <laughs> Barbara where you could score crack and, and uh, transvestite hookers. And so, of course, we had why do, you, to... why do you say I would know this so well? You're like, <laughs> well, you would know, you would know. <laughs> and so, so, of course, we had to put our record store right in the middle of that. And uh, Nerfurter had a song called Down on Haley. And, and you know, we're huge Santa Barbara nerds. And so we're just sure. like, oh, well, we got to name our, our, our store after the Nerfurter song. So, so yeah, the Atari is it after the video game system? What's that now? How did you name the band? Is it after the video game system? Yeah, my Chris uh, had named it back in Indiana when it was him and a drum machine. He was doing demos. Chris is so talented. He would do these crazy little demos where he had one called MC Fuck Breath, which was like his his uh, um, uh, electronic. Oh, and I've heard that, dude. That's a Barbra Streisand song. Yeah, <laughs> electronic metal. And then the Ataris was his pop punk. And he did this other one that was like the queers style. And so he would do these demos with drum machines and the Ataris was named because he collected Atari games. He had like 500 or something Atari oh, wow. games collected. So did so you see that, that Atari uh, ET like documentary thing that they made? No, I didn't see it. Uh -uh. It's a really fun documentary. It's totally worth watching. I'll check it out. Yeah, it's like the worst video game ever made. And so oh, I've heard that. I've heard they put about the most that. money into it or whatever. And so the yeah. documentary is all about it. And and now isn't that unopened box work? They threw a bunch of them away or something. Is that that's the exactly one? yeah, I didn't want to throw it away, but that's exactly it. Yeah. They they say that they put them all in like a dump. So is it true or not? And that's what the documentary is about. Yeah. And I won't spoil yeah. it for you, but it's very much fun to watch. It's really good. I'm gonna check that. I've heard that. I heard I heard that somebody went and rescued some or and they're worth big money or something. Like well, video that. games are a lot of money now on the pack. I don't people are collecting shit that's just crazy to me. I don't know. I don't it's nuts. Yeah. I just got into a little bit to NFTs. You know what those are? 
A little bit, yeah. So I was doing the NBA one that was on here, and then I, I kind of stopped recently because it seems like too many people are jumping on it. I don't know. I just yeah. in the beginning because you, you couldn't get them. I, right. I'd sign on and I couldn't get fucking packs. So I was like, well, you know, I'll sign on again and I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. ridiculous. I just saw yesterday for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, they uh, were selling NFTs of old uh, floats uh, from the parade over the years. They were going for like $20,000. I'm like, who has money for that? Why? I don't get it. I, I short lived. I, to me, I think the NFT thing's crazy nuts. I don't know. Although I want to jump in on, I have all these Bob Marley negatives that have never yeah, been Yeah, you told me. me about that. Yeah, you told so me. I want to jump in on the NFT of bandwagon and see with those. So we'll see what happens. I don't know if I'll really do it, but it'll be fun. Yeah, that's smart. That's yeah, smart. if it works, you know, I don't know. See how it goes. Cool. All right. So uh, today's Black Friday. Did you guys... Did you guys go get shit? I was going to go to the 99 cent store. I was going to see if I could get any crazy deals. <laughs> I love the 99 cent store in LA. It's terrible in Santa Barbara, but once I moved to LA, I love it. But no, I didn't go anywhere today uh, for Black Friday. Um, I'm going tomorrow. I like to go on uh, Saturday after the hullabaloo has passed. How about you, John? Look at the wreckage. <laughs> yeah, look at the wreckage. Yeah. <laughs> No, oh, no, no. I don't go out for that crap anymore. Uh -uh. But I did hear that the dollar store here in, well, I don't know if there's dollar stores in California. Oh, yeah, we got dollar stores, sure. Okay, but now they're $1.25. I heard that too. Inflation. Yeah. yeah. And they charge you 10 cents for the bag? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. They do. <laughs> they totally do here. Yeah. So uh, did you guys, I'm assuming you guys used to play at Velvet Jones a lot or? We did, yeah. I mean, especially versus the world. So Donald, my singer, um, uh, is a is a bartender, and now he owns a bar in Santa Barbara. It's actually Galita. I don't know if you remember uh, the place called the Back Door. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. So now he owns a place called the Imperial. Is in the old Back Door spot, and nice. it's like the trendiest, like uh, uh, more of that, uh, you know, um, like John is right now, the man bun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> going on craft um, cocktails yeah 20 dollars out of bird cages yeah exactly um but he came up as a bartender at the velvet jones that's what he did uh all the years when versus the world come home from tour he would he would bartend there oh, okay yeah because i had craig jenkins on that's why i brought up and then nick, nick rucker was on with with craig awesome um, kind of small is good friend of mine and a great guy he craig was great because he owned bill's bus as, as he probably told you right on your thing and so what craig would also do is rent vans and so whenever versus had a u.s tour or a canadian tour um craig would would shoot us a van for those tours so oh cool yeah it was you guys really do any stuff with toad or with um ugly kid joe or I know I'll let, John, wagon, I'll let John answer the Glenn Phillips connection to the Ataris. How's that? Go yeah, you know, Glenn sang on uh, a song on So Long Astoria, and he actually performed with us on uh, Jay Leno. Yeah. Oh, neat. Yeah. And, and at our one, as you know, being a Santa Barbara guy, uh, the uh, and I was born and raised in Orchid, uh, which is a little north there. Um, and uh, the big, uh, you know, milestone for us is to play the ball. And uh, we finally got to play the bowl and Glenn actually played with us at the bowl also. So oh, it's cool. He's such a sweetheart. He's such a nice guy. Yeah. He's, he's fabulous. And uh, so, yeah, whenever I look at, there's always snaps of us on Leno and I always see Glenn, Glenn behind us there on that. But, you know, when we did Leno, we decided. How to tall go. are you, Mike? You look pretty tall. I am. I'm six two. I I sky. Is Glenn, like, Glenn's like the size of your leg standing there. Actually, Mike is all torso. He's got. Yeah, a little, it's true. I have teeny little legs. He's got almost the same pant length as me, and he's I just. Do. It's true. My head. My, nickname, up that head. my nickname in the band is Torso Man. So, <laughs> torso Man. Yeah, Torso Man. So That's a good song title. Maybe that should be the next album. Oh yeah, Chris would love that. <laughs> Chris would love that. All right, so. Have any of you, have either of you guys actually met Don Henley? Well, I've spoken to Don Henley on the phone twice, and, and it's a great story. Um, if you want to hear it, I'll go into it. I don't know. Uh, should we hear it, John? It yeah. Bad? No. It's, yeah. All right. Then fine. This, this is, uh, I actually wrote uh, um, like a 35, 40 page short story that I want to be in one in in my novel, I, and I really like yours, by the way. But uh, about this this, and it's called "Who the Fuck Is Don Henley?" And so uh, basically, 
Um, we were playing Boys of Summer. Boys of Summer happened organically. Uh, Chris and I were in a truck stop one night in El Paso and we heard it over the loudspeaker when we were shopping for knickknacks up and down the aisles. And he turned to me like he would do often. It was like two in the morning and the bus is outside and he's like, oh, I love this song. I'm all, oh man, this song. I'm a little older than, than Chris and, and, and Chris, our drummer, Chris and Chris. Um, and I would say, I said, yeah, this is high school for me. Don Henley is, is, you know, my high school time and boys of summer was a, a huge song for me. He said, yeah, it reminds me of going to my grandma's house down in Florida. He's like, we should, we should cover it. I'm like, okay. So the next night we're in El Paso and he starts noodling with the song. And I think John starts picking up with Chris a little bit on the song. And, um, and we kind of do a dry run through and it just kind of like, found us, if that makes sense. It was just like, oh my God, this song is perfect. So the next night is El Pas is uh, San Antonio and yeah. we preview it the first time live. We play it live that night in San Antonio and the kids go crazy and you can just feel like our early song, San Dimas, when we would play that, you can just feel when a song connects to people. And so I remember the next night after that was South by Southwest was our big, big uh, preview for Columbia Records. And Chris was like, oh, I don't know if we should play it out here. They're going to want us to, to record it if we do. And, and so I'm, I'm always pushing him, you know, yeah, we, we should play this as the business guy. I, I know I just see money, right, or whatever. I'm just like, this is money, right? This is popularity. This is everything. I want to be a rock star, right? That's, that was my deal. And Chris was more, I want to be a musician, you know what I mean? And so um, that's where we also butt heads at times. But, um, yeah, but the yin and yang can be really positive too. Exactly. That kind of yin and yang. I mean, so we play it at South by Southwest and Columbia is goo goo. They're just like, oh my God, you've got to record the song. We're not going to, we promise we're not going to put it on your record, but we're going to put it on the Godzilla soundtrack, the Matthew Broderick Godzilla, right? And oh, so, cool. so when we're recording for, for so long a story, we record Boys of Summer. And um, they come to us and they say, look, it missed the soundtrack. It, did, it didn't make Godzilla. But I'll tell you what, put it on your record. I promise, promise it's not going to be a single. You just put it on your record. Chris fought him. No, I don't want to be known uh, as a cover so band. Are you saying, yeah, let's do it, let's do it? Or you're kind of just not even getting involved? Oh, I'm always let's do it. Yeah. I well, that, but I believed foolishly that they wouldn't do that because it wound up being track 10. And there's never, ever a hit that's track 10 on anybody's record. Usually yeah. your, your biggest hits are between one and four. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. six, but it's not It's like 10. baseball. You got to come out of the gates. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, they, so they tell us, okay, just put it on the record. It won't be a single. It won't be a single, I swear. So then the record comes out and uh, our first song in this diary goes to like number 10, I think, for four weeks. And it does really super well. And so... We're like, okay, we're going to follow up. The second single is going to be So Long Astoria, our title track to the album. And we got this whole video planned out. And then all of a sudden we start hearing Boys of Summer on K-Rock. And, and they come to us and they tell us this, they tell us this is your next single. And we're like, no way. So Chris starts fighting it. This is what, you know, so Chris. Did you ever find out later, like who leaked it to K-Rock or how it got into the circulation or? K-Rock did it on their own. It's very rare for a radio station to actually yeah. do that on their own. And, and just a quick side note before we get to the Don Henley call. It's kind of a surreal moment because we were so anti against this that we went to Columbia and met with Don Einer, the president of Columbia. Four idiots in this guy's corner office, he's chain smoking. He's like a massive dude. Were you, you wearing know, sandals? Uh, no, <laughs> we had like, kind of barber joke. Yeah, you know, yeah, probably. You know, you know, Kevin Lyman would, would go in the meetings with a fanny pack on and pink hair. And Birkenstocks. <laughs> Right, but the guy w was chain smoking and he's like, oh, the Ataris, come on in. Like, uh, yeah. well, never going to happen. Fuck K Rock. And you guys are a career band. We, you had a history and all this. And we're eating it up. And right before we left, Mike, do you remember he asked about a soundtrack and you told him what that it should be uh, Pink or somebody like that? Yeah, and he did it. Well, I forgot what the soundtrack was, but he was like, we lost this. We, we were, we, we wanted a soundtrack. And, and he goes, by the way, I lost the band on some soundtrack. And Mike goes, you should get pink. Yeah. I, I, mm. I, I swear to God, he did it. He got pink on the soundtrack it was massive. But anyway, <laughs> we tried to fight it with the president. And he literally told us it's not going to happen. 
And of course, it happened not many weeks later. They're like, uh, guys, do you have a treatment for the uh, Boys of Summer video that you got to make? <laughs> yeah. So K-Rock, it was brilliant for K-Rock too, because summer was coming. It was California. We were the headliner for the Warp Tour. We're going to be there for the Warp Tour. So why not push Boys of Summer? I mean, it was really brilliant move, but it really infuriated Chris because Chris and 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 rightly so because we'd had this great indie career of our own songs and then all of a sudden we're on a major label and we're going to be known for for a cover song and to this day I mean in this diary I hear Boys of Summer on K-Rock once a day still to this day and um and in this diary is gone it is gone and uh and I've never heard it again on, on mainstream rock radio, but that's okay. You know, it, it is, I love Boys of Summer. I love Henley and I love the song, but anyway, so, so uh, Chris is fighting against it, right? He's fighting against Boys of Summer and we get put on K-Rock's Weenie Roast and Chris decides they're putting pressure on us. Chris refuses to play it live. I'm not gonna play that song live. Forget that, that's not going in my set. So Columbia, we have this big meeting at the Live 105 in, in, uh, in San Francisco at their radio show. And uh, we didn't play it at that show. And the next day is the Weenie Roast. And they come in and they tell us, if you don't play Boys of Summer tomorrow at the Weenie Roast, your career's dead. Basically, the year career's dead kind of a, kind of a speech. Remember that? That was like the most. Well, it, Char- it was Charlie Walk. And, and Charlie oh. Walk was on some stupid uh like a voice show and he actually got canceled recently like um, two years it's been two years but yeah so, <laughs> so so the next night chris chris buckles he's like oh i'll play boys of summer for them so but right before the show he writes this shirt with a sharpie a blue shirt with a sharpie i still have that shirt to this day um it says who the fuck is don henley on this shirt right so we go on and we we slay the the weenie roast we killed it we played boys of summer chris put those kiss blood packs in his mouth he explodes them and blood stripping down his face onto the who, who the fuck is don henley shirt and then we're ushered backstage and rolling stone comes up and takes a picture of us click of us right there and then and then but you guys gave it your all during the performance of the song yeah. It wasn't like any reluctance. It's like, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I was always cool with playing and I was always trying to tell Chris, come on, just play the song. It's going <laughs> to be okay. But he's, he, I have no morals. Chris is just like, <laughs> you know, hence, hence my problems with the feds. Um, Chris is just like, yeah, yeah. You know, I told them I'm not going to do what I told them not to do. But anyway, we buckle, we play it. Rolling Stone takes this picture and the next issue of Rolling Stone, we get the call. We got a problem. Um, They write an article basically insinuating that we don't care about Don Henley, like that we're saying we do the song better. It it didn't say that in exact words, but it insinuated it and it offended Don Henley, which really doesn't make a difference. You should blame Black Flag. (laughs) except, Except that we were playing the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. We played Boys of Summer on second base at Cellular Field in Chicago. And to play somebody else's song on live TV, you need the songwriter's permission. Oh, so shit. Don Henley said, nope, you're not playing that song at baseball. And that was huge for us. We were like, hey, me and John are both giant baseball fans, even though I, I'm sadly, he's a Yankees fan. Um, I, uh, uh, we were like, we, and management's pushing on us. You've got to play this. You've got to call. So our manager, Darren Lewis, gives us these, these two phone numbers. He used to work with Irving Azoff, and he had these two Don Henley phone numbers, like cell phone numbers. So at this time, though, is Chris super stuck that you're not going to be playing the song? No. He, no he, yeah, I, I think he wanted us to do I think he wanted to do it. I think he wanted to do the All-Star game for sure. Yeah. Who doesn't want to play the All-Star game, right? Yeah, that'd be super you know? fun. Okay. Yeah, so... So my manager, they try to contact Don, Don through all these like regular uh, ways of contacting him, like uh, through manager to manager and this and that. And Don's, Don's cold shouldering him. No, I'm not going to let him do the song. And so they give me you these call songs. Stevie Nicks and then have Stevie Nicks call him and be like, hey. <laughs> it was pretty close to that. So they give, yeah. me these, they give me these two cell phone numbers and they keep pushing on me. Did you call him? Did you call him? Oh, well, not yet, man. So. Finally, after we played the Kimmel show, I go back to my hotel room and we're getting down to zero time there. And I call, I call these two numbers. And the first one is disconnected. I thought, oh my God, these aren't going to work. The second one I call is just like, 
no message, just a beat. So I'm pretty wasted. And I just laid down this, this heartfelt message. It was actually completely true. I had played um, uh, Life in the Fast Lane at my father's funeral. My father died in a car accident when I was 19. And so he loved Don Henley. And so I, I told Don I, in the message, I just said, look, man, I'm really sorry about, I think you misunderstand what Chris meant to put on his shirt. And then the journalist took it out of context. And I explained the story I told you about um, how we were kind of forced into Boys of Summer and everything. I'm just letting you know, Don, we're going to start covering all your fucking songs. <laughs> yeah. And then I told him, I said, I told him, you know, about my dad's funeral got really heartfelt on him. And then that was it. I hung up the phone. And then uh, it, I didn't hear anything. And then we're driving to Sacramento right before we were supposed to fly the next day. We play San Francisco the next night. And then we're driving to Sacramento and I get a call on my phone while I'm driving and you know cell cell reception wasn't that great in 2003 so I pull over I pull over and answer the phone and I'll never forget his first words he's like yo Mike I'm all yeah he's like it's Don Henley I'm like whoa and he said I know what it's like to be young and climbing the ladder of rock and roll and everything's a big deal that's the first thing he says to me and it, I was just like he was just dropping nuggets of wisdom on me, man. You're One like, out. what's Hotel California really about? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's about Stevie Nicks. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. I don't know. But um, but yeah, he was super cool. And at the end, he gave me permission. We talked back and forth. And being the businessman that I am, I actually tried to pitch him for us to go on the MTV Music Awards and play Boys of Summer together. Oh, that would like, be really cool. Like they were doing at that time. But uh, so don't get carried away, young man. Yeah. <laughs> Listen here, torso yeah. guy. Just nah. keep sending me those checks. Yeah, he said, nah, I don't do anything like that. But Well, it's not that, just the check for your guys' song. I mean, it revived that song. It did, for Water. sure. For sure. And then I had to actually call him one other time after that to get permission to play um, in Canada. We played uh, Boys of Summer on something and they go, Mike, you need to do it again. Call Don Henley. So I called him up. But yeah, he was really super nice to me, yet he wouldn't play with me on the MTV Music Awards. So <laughs> that would have been really special. What a cool. Right. Movie. Yeah. You know, so, you know, life ain't over yet. Maybe one day. You know, all I can say is that uh, um, I, I tried. I, I, I didn't hold back. That's for sure. I, I usually don't. So I usually yeah. get some who put uh Who picked Black Flag for the song change? John's got a great. John. Well, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Chris did it f more for like a, uh, for Bill Stevenson uh, because Bill had recorded the guys in the past. So yeah, we, did, oh, we did two albums. Bill, obviously, Bill was a drummer, obviously, Black Flag. So, yeah, we did two albums with Bill and Stefan from The Descendants. And um, not just that, but um, if I remember correctly, Chris did 40 different takes on 40 different bands. He did Built to Spill sticker. He did oh. uh, Elliot Smith sticker. He, did, <laughs> he went through 40 different bands. He had a whole list. Chris is a list master. And he went through each list. And when we went back and listened back to him, Black Flag just sounded perfect. Totally. It was like, wow, that he did Descendants. He actually said Descendants stick yeah, on yeah, Black Descendants would be cool too. Yeah, but Black Flag just sounded perfect. And we're like, oh, that's a winner. Got to do you it. guys, do you know? So the other night, Mike and I talked for a long time. <laughs> we're yeah. just going through all these music guys. But do you know yeah. Doug Carry On as well? I, I know who Doug Carry On is, and I read a little bit in your book about how how that kind of got you into the biz, correct? Oh, Doug? it did. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't going there, but it totally did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I I know who he is, but I don't know him personally. Okay, just wondering. Yeah. Uh, neat guy. He was a lot of different bands all over the place too. He so. knows Glenn well, though, right? Um, Glenn from Toad. Yeah. I don't know. I think Doug and Glenn know each other. Yeah, I think maybe so. from surfing stuff. Is Glenn yeah, a big I surfer? I think so. I that would make so. sense. So yeah. I believe it. Yeah. And um, no, no, Anna, I don't even know. <laughs> okay. That's a good story, though. I like the idea of like, so he was going through all the different bands and you end up picking back flag. I, you know, when there's stuff that's gone through your head so many times, you just can't think of it in a different light. You'd be like, really? You know, huh? Okay. It's sort of like uh, Guns and Roses where they have the original Don't Cry and then they did the other Don't Cry and you yeah. hear it and it's great, but you're just kind of like, what the fuck is going on here, man? 
<laughs> I, I, always, I always say about Boys of Summer, it definitely found us. It wasn't one of these things where we're like, oh, we got a hit song on our on our hands. No, not at all. But not only that, for a long time, a lot of the fans thought that was our song. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a generation gap. Yeah. 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 I would always say it was the best song we never wrote. And that is exactly <laughs> why Chris wrote Who the Fuck is Don Henley? It wasn't because we were talking about Don Henley. It was because all of our fans thought it was our song. So Chris did the shirt as a, okay, this is who Don Henley is, but it, it all got misconstrued. Huh. As it usually does. We'll talk about Toad and stuff. All I Want wasn't ever supposed to be on the record. That was not, that was not something they were planning on. It was a serious last minute thing to put it on the record. Yeah. I, lo I love that song too. That's a great song. Oh, it's so good. And then Walk on the Ocean is yeah. just uh, just, random. They're just temp lyrics. It doesn't, yeah. it don't, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did a documentary on them that we never released. And so I asked Glenn about every song he ever wrote, the poor guy, and for hours and hours and hours. Oh, yeah. You know, just everything you could ask this poor dude about. And uh, so I got all this information, but walk on the ocean. If you get online, they tell you how it's about the Vietnam War and all this shit. And no, it's, it's just. <laughs> crap. And they listened and they're like, you know, it sounds all right. And they left it. That's cool. It's yeah. like uh, when we make records or we're working on new songs for a record, we always put like temporary titles up um, on the board and verses. We do that. And I think in the Ataris, we do that too. And sometimes they just stick and that ends up being the title. And you're like, oh, I never meant for that to be that, you know? Yeah. So. That's cool. Okay, so this one is, I like this one sometimes. And being where you guys are from, this might be good. So some of the funniest gigs you've played at. Yeah, we played some wild ones in those early days. But I, I think for me, I think one of the craziest ones for me was the Slim Jim. Uh, do you remember that one, John? That, were you there on that one? It was uh, in Atlanta. It was at the stadium, baseball stadium. And it was the Slim Jim Hoop It Up uh, uh, tour and basically we played on a stage with midget wrestling like i guess i should call them as little, people. Little, people little people wrestling yeah little people wrestling um uh, randy the macho man savage introdu oh. introduced us introduced us and when i tell you these little people were angry they were angry at each other like the fight carrying on out of the out of the ring and and back in our trailer area where they were running into each other's trailers, attacking each other and stuff. It was insane. It was uh, one of the most insane. And they had, you know, a lot of pro wrestlers there. And it was just like circus. It was, it was wild. The Jimmy Kimmel show, the odd thing about that was the guests. It was Johnny Cochran, Zach Galifianakis, and Alf. <laughs> yeah. Alf. <laughs> and when we were playing, they had to do the Alf, like I'm one of the speakers on the side, like jamming. Like, you know, I, I love that. I always, always, when I watch that, I always, I, I go right over to Alf with my bass <laughs> and I'm just like rocking, banging my head with Alf and he's banging his head back at me. Uh, the crazy thing about Alf, it takes like three people to operate one for the voice and two, two one for the head and one for the arms. There's like three people for Alf. Well, how big's the puppet? Huge. Like, I mean, but it's just the top torso. It's just like me. It's just, a, <laughs> it's just the torso and the head and the rest is in a box. And these people are underneath the box. All yeah. doing their thing. I wonder how many elf puppets they have. They got to have a lot. I don't know. We only saw one at Kimmel. <laughs> <laughs> we, oh, we, only... Played, we played one time um, in, uh, oh God, Kelowna, British Columbia. It was this terrible thing called Wake Stock. Yeah. And the way they had it set up was, the, the stage and then it was like a moat of water and then a cr then kind of a small hill with the most drunk whack jobs ever and that that it wasn't so much <laughs> it was kind of funny because prior to us playing i i wasn't there yet mike was uh this was when we were like in 2004 we were just trying to do a bunch of one-offs to pay off all our debts from all the shit that we did the year before and, and the, this young lady asked Mike, she was doing the production stuff at, at the festival. And she said, she's looking at our tech writer and she's like, uh, it, it, the lighting doesn't make sense here. It just says completely dark, except some, some red lights on the back by the drummer. And Mike's like, yep, that's what our singer likes. He was getting into this crazy strokes thing. We didn't ask 
questions and, and Mike's like, that's it. Yeah. And she's like, well, we're not going to do that. That'll look stupid. And he's like, listen, just, you know, let's not cause everybody a headache. Just go by the tech writer, please. And she was giving him a hard time. And basically he was like, listen, you do what it said and just get away from me. Okay. Sure. That was that. I didn't really even know anything about it. Now we're playing this show, red lights in the back, drunk, crazy people. Occasionally some wakeboarder would go by in the moat <laughs> while we're playing. <laughs> Mike's uh third, girl, third, third wife. Third wife. Third wife number three was there. And she's frail. She's she's not uh she's not a danger to anybody. She's really not. And she had to go to the bathroom, couldn't find one, went behind a bush, peed in a cup. Big deal, right? <laughs> well, this chick that was the production woman saw her. And when she came back to the stage, she got two gorillas to come and grab Charlene by the neck and drag her off stage. Now I can't see cause it's dark, but we started a song where kids playing, I'm playing. And then I don't hear the rest of the band come in. And I'm like, what's going on? I see a dog pile on the side of the stage. It's Mike, Chris Rowe, two gorillas and Charlene. <laughs> They're fighting, trying to get her off, trying to get these guys off. So, and I look at kid and he's just like, like shaking like i don't know i'm like yeah, keep playing like so they they break it up chris Rowe comes back on the stage he's like ah oh, man these security in this place sucks i want everybody to say you know uh, fuck the security and that's all it needed bottles getting thrown onto the stage everybody's chanting fuck the security he's like this is our last song and we don't play anything super fast but it was like whatever the fastest song we could play yeah when it's over chris just starts tearing the stage apart now of course everything's rented he's tearing shit jumping all the speakers he grabs the kick drum and he's and he's not the, an athletic guy and he's running, he's doing the high step with the knees and the elbows out. And he's running with this kick drum and he throws the thing into the water. Into the okay. boat. He throws the kick drum into the moat. And now, of course, the guys that were doing the rental gear are chasing him <laughs> out the stage. And, and then our guys are chasing our crew and then they're starting to push and shove. And it was a complete shit show. And when we came in the back of the stage, you know, Mike's arguing with this young lady because, you know, it was bullshit. And uh, all I remember saying was, everybody, shut up. I'm like, you got our money? Like, do you have our check? And the guy gave us our check, and we left. That's great. <laughs> Total disaster. Yeah, sounds it, man. Yeah, that was crazy. And, and the crazy thing about that is, we, as John said, we were trying to pay off our debts uh, on that. Uh, but we, we ended up with a massive one. That drum set, <laughs> the, the drum set in the moat cost us. And, you know, that's what I was thinking about. I was thinking because, uh, you know, I was thinking about some tour stories when I was thinking about doing this podcast. And I was thinking about how how it was Chris's job. Chris destroyed the gear. And I destroyed the backstages. <laughs> so basically, you know, coming, coming that is from, very true. Yeah, coming from Orchid, you know, I just when I get wasted, I just was like, this is what rock stars do, right? We destroy our dressing room. So like I what, was, what would uh, you do? Like put holes well, in the, the wall? First thing you would do was it was like the squeeze bottles would start going, right? <laughs> mayonnaise and this and that. Then it would be something thrown. And then he would grab our drum tech and literally do Old West and throw them into the table of food. Yeah, I would always sweep our, our roadie with the uh, whatever <laughs> whatever tech we had. Okay, <laughs> interviews over. No. <laughs> with, the ta- with the table of food. That was my... Yeah, but he was in on it. Like that, that was, was like... Food. Yeah, by the way, thrown around. Most yeah. of the time, our roadie Matt our drum tech he was completely naked <laughs> yeah. oh, after the show he, yeah he would come back there was always a party and matt would just walk through like like normal but completely naked and people would just like freak out and he would just hang out have a beer <laughs> yeah a lot of the bands that we toured with you know they would think they'd have preconceived notions about because of our records and 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 you know our image on and then when they would tour with us they'd be like oh my god those guys are insane <laughs> uh, you gotta watch out for the atari so <laughs> but you know we 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 burned bright very quickly so so my friend ryan whitman asked me to ask you guys so how many how many shows what's the most amount of shows you guys have done in the same day like how many sets like matinees or whatever you call it 
if you were trying to get money back, did you guys do like three or four performances in one day? We did have, remember in, in, uh, in Australia a lot, you do two, you do a uh, 18 and under and an 18 and over. Um, there's a lot of that. And then sometimes you're rushed to do an acoustic show. What do you got, Don? You got we did four show. We did four, at least four shows. We did a grad. This is another great one. We got asked to do a grad night in Florida at the uh, islands of adventure or universal, whatever it was. And I'm like, this is going to be the worst thing ever. How did we say yes to this bullshit? It was us and unwritten law. So oh, wow. we all fly into Orlando and you know, we're at the hard rock. They couldn't have been nicer than people at the hard rock. They like named ice cream after us. We did, we did like um, wake up calls for guests. They asked us if we wanted to cook. They did everything for us. So the first day that we go and play, it was two shows. It was like an earlier show and a late show. And I was like, this is probably going to be crap. But so anyway, the first, because we're literally set up a stage underneath a roller coaster. Like anybody could stop by and watch the show. First show, like thousand plus kids waiting just waiting and there was no barricade no security it was absolute shit show it was great right so we played those shows we go back to the hotel the singer of unwritten law gets into a fist fight with his girlfriend full-on fist fight both of them punching each other That's and then get arrested he gets arrested so the next day we didn't even know about this until the next day where we we go on this um they let us go on like a cut the line tour to go on all the rides we're with Unwritten Law, the band. And then they're like kind of, by, oh, by the way, yeah. What's his name? Scott. 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 Oh, Scott got arrested. We don't know if he'll up later. Okay. Yeah. So he doesn't. So the people at the, uh, at the Islands Adventure, whatever, they're running it, they they came and asked us, right? They were like, hey, look, they're not going to play. Can you play extra sets? Oh, and I was like, uh, I'm like, no, that'll suck. And this is a true story. And she's like, we'll give you $10,000 more. I'm like, when do we start? Yeah, sounds great. What a wonderful <laughs> idea. Yeah. We did. We did at least four. But we didn't have acoustics. So I, I know we were, we probably mixed it up. Yeah. We, also, we also did, um, we did two days and f at least four shows at the Chain Reaction. Yeah, that was fun. We that did this. Fun. We did this thing. We did like an acoustic show, and then a rock show, and then another rock show, and then we did one where we we made a wheel, a pinwheel, with all our songs on it, and we passed out numbers randomly to kids in the crowd, and then it was like, uh, number one, step to the stage, please. And the kids <laughs> come right. They're like, spin the wheel, dude, and whatever song came up, we were like, just rocked right into it. Yeah. So did the guy stay on the stage when you played? I, I he probably got thrown off. I don't yeah. remember. <laughs> the reaction the stage is so small. We barely fit on the stage. Oh my god. Yeah. So yeah, there was a lot of stuff like that. That's fun. Yeah. So when I was first putting together a podcast, I was at my buddy's house. He has a daughter in fifth grade, and uh, her and her girlfriends. They said that I should ask everybody the question of when did you first feel famous. So I ask you guys, when did you first feel famous? If fame is not a road you choose to go down, uh, we can also say like a pivotal point in your life or career that uh, you're proud of or is worth mentioning some event. I don't know for me if it's famous. I mean, because I did, we did feel famous for a while. I mean, with, with MTV and the Hard Rock Live and all that stuff. Um, I would say the pivotal moment for me was what's called the Fat Records Tour. Um, I remember we were out with Beefcake, John's band, and we were, San Dimas High School Football Rules, a song of ours, got released on a Fat, fat Records compilation, OFX's label. Sure. And, and, and it took off. It was all of a sudden, we started seeing our shows triple, quadruple people come. All of a sudden, the phone started ringing at Royal Flush, our booking agent, and big bands were like, Oh, we want the Ataris on our tour. And so they, even though we only had an EP on Fat Records, they asked us to, um, uh, to open the Fat Records tour, which for me at the time was no, was no use for a name, good riddance, 
and the Mad Caddies. And we were the opener out of four. And um, I was honored because Fat Records was like my ultimate dream at that time. Oh, if I ever get a record on Fat Records. And then, and then to be on that tour with all those bands I worship. And so we started that tour and we were, we were opening the tour and we, the kids were going bananas. And I just remember looking out those nights on the tour going, wow, how did I get here? You know, this is, it wasn't that long ago I was playing, you know, Toes Tavern and everyone was leaving or whatever in Santa Barbara, you know, or, or the living room or something like that. So, yeah. Um, but famous, I would say, you know, when I smashed my bass on the Hard Rock Live of MTV, I, I felt pretty famous at the time. They, they, they boxed it up and put a plaque on it. And now it hangs in the Hard Rock Cafe in Indianapolis, Indiana. So I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's cool. I, so. I think uh, the thing is, is when, when things were the most successful in the band, we were touring all the time. So I didn't really see it. Right. I would get phone calls from people. Oh, your radio, your, your shit's on the radio every day, 20 times a day. I'm like, really? You know? Um, and then even when we came home from tour, I, I was like, Mike, we were a bit older. So like, it wasn't like I had tons of friends that were with, they had family. Some of my friends already had families and shit, you know, I was 30 years old. So occasionally I would like, I couldn't sleep. So I would see our video at like two in the morning and it would freak me out. I was like, wow, this is weird. But to me, because Mike was obviously on the fat tour, I wasn't on the fat tour. I can't remember the exact festival we played. It was in 2001. It was after the warp tour. We went to Europe. It was one of the festivals that we played in England where they said, uh, you're going to do a signing after the show, which I always hated doing. Mm -hmm. And I was the new guy. So it was always weird to do that but whatever it was we did the signing it was all pretty pretty cool and then they said all right we got to walk you around this way everybody put your pens away and i was like why and once we turned the corner it was like i felt like a beetle the kids were going ape shit it was like it was like a fence and they were just piling on the fence trying to like <laughs> ask for you know it was it was pretty a wild thing i was like i came from a band called beefcake we couldn't buy a fan i mean the fans we had were like overweight 17 year old kids that wanted to like light shit on fire in somebody's house like <laughs> i wasn't used to it at all so it was, that, was out, that was outside of manchester i remember that yeah yeah, yeah. And, it was, and we were running for our lives yeah we, it was you're, crazy you're, it you're, was a crazy you're, moment I mean, we were pinned against that fence running yeah. for our lives and um yeah that was a that was a scary moment that's like who is chasing me i'm like me and john are like 30 year old men were like, were like <laughs> I felt like a kid, you know, I yeah. felt like a kid because, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I get them chasing kid, our drummer, Chris, we called him kid because we have Chris, Chris and kid, but I get them chasing Chris and kid, but I was like, why are they chasing me and John? <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Maybe they were going to give you beers. But yeah, that would have been good. I would have taken it. Good. Drugs would have been better, but. <laughs> <laughs> Well, guys, I really do appreciate your time. I actually had talked to Donald Spence earlier today. I was He was going to try and jump on and surprise you guys. Oh. Yeah, that's why when you were talking about him, that's why I keep looking at my phone was because I'm texting. I'm like, if you can get on, this is a perfect time. I but actually, I we obviously, he, he is one of my best friends in my whole life. I'm sure he told you the same thing. Uh, we love each other. And he he called me yesterday for Thanksgiving. We called, I, we talked on the phone and uh, I told him about this. So I said, yeah i'm doing this with john so you know um, donald is great donald would be good me and donald uh talking to is is hilarious. that'd be fun to sc screw with you guys a little bit you wouldn't have expected exactly that, you know, so. that would have been great but i would have been that bar actually tonight and he's like uh the thanks the friday after thanksgiving is a fucking crazy buddy so yeah he's like what's he said to say hello which is why i bring it up so, awesome yeah. awesome awesome yeah i told him about this last night so i'm super stoked that cool. he did it. He reached well, out and his bar is amazing except that they're 20 dollar cocktails so um oh yeah you know, what are you gonna do if you no, ask everything is now man i don't know i'm living out by you mike uh and i'd moved from agora actually right by the canyon club down here yeah and uh the beers here i know you aren't drinking but the beers yeah. here it's like 10 bucks you know whereas up there i could get a drink for five six bucks so yeah 
I, I love it uh, here in North Hollywood. I got to tell you that I'm, uh, after all those years in Santa Barbara, it's it's a nice change. So it's yeah. nice to be in the city. I'm not saying I'm here forever because uh, I love my heart is definitely in Santa Barbara, but um, I love it right now. So well, changes yeah. here and there make it life. Yeah, or That's make make, life. makes life interesting. Makes but uh, I look forward to to reading the rest of your rest of your book. It, it was <laughs> hilarious. I really like it. So, yeah, that was the whole point of it was to try and get a laugh out of people. So it, it's hilarious. I like it. Cool. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe by clicking the round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or the guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle's Joel Rody. And don't forget, when you party like a rock star, don't be a dick. <laughs>